Hello there, my name is Tyler Griffin. And I'm Kinley Griffin. And this is Scripture Study Insights by Scripture Central. Today, Alma 17 through 22. And I am so excited to welcome another one of my beautiful daughters, Kinley, to join me for these incredible chapters that we're going to discuss today. And this is, this is a privilege to be able to share this time with, with Kinley as we go through these, these stories. And before we dive in, and before I say anything that's on my mind, uh, I just wanted to, to ask for Kinley's opinion, Kinley's thoughts on what did you gain from reading chapter 17 through 22 in preparation for coming and filming with, with your dad? What stuck out for you in these chapters? You know, of course, there are so, so many things that, that these chapters have in them. I think one big uh, theme that I kept noticing, um, I guess the best way to share this would be President Nelson's words. He, in his talk, Overcome the World and Find Rest, he talked about how important it is to learn to love God more than anything else as part of being in a covenant relationship with him being willing to give up anything, being willing to do whatever he asks. And I feel like in these chapters, I kept noticing again and again, it's story after story of people coming to know the Savior and being willing to give up everything they have to follow him and to become like him and to live his gospel. That's beautiful. And that ties in very closely with one of the lifelong learning overlays that I wanted to share, which is this notion of a sacrifice. Um, so, so we'll use an altar here as the symbol, the object lesson. The question being, what am I willing to sacrifice or lay down on the altar as a sign of, as an expression of my love for the Lord? Because he already laid down on the altar an infinite sacrifice for us. He, he gave everything for us. And now, as we go through these stories, we see multiple people willing to give up all kinds of things to uh, better uh, come to know the Lord and to serve him more completely and to, as you said, build that connection, that relationship with him. So. As we dive into chapter 17, we, we begin these, these verses with Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni, these four sons who, they didn't exactly have the ideal um, gospel childhood or, or youth years because they had rebelled against everything their, their father, King Mosiah, had taught them, and they've really struggled. And now, after their conversion experience, they're on the covenant path. But I love what we see in chapter 17 in these beginning verses about what they're, they're willing to sacrifice on an ongoing basis. Amen. I think, too, it's interesting in verses 2 and 3, it talks about who they've become from that um, troubled past, I guess, where they struggled with a lot of things. And this is, this is powerful to me because this is something I can do every day. It says they searched the scriptures diligently that they might know the word of God and that they gave themselves to fasting and prayer. These are simple gospel concepts that we can live every day of our lives, every, every week, every month, every year. It's just one day at a time striving to connect with God, striving to to sacrifice a little bit of our time here and there to give the Lord his fair share, right? I think that's beautiful. That is beautiful. So, as we jump in, I love the fact that you've pointed out, Kinley, that Ammon, Aaron, Omner, and Himni, they spent all this time searching the scriptures so they could become men of sound understanding, as well as this fasting and prayer, gaining the spirit of prophecy and revelation. It's almost as if you could cross-reference verse 2 and 3 with Doctrine and Covenants, section 8, verse 2 and 3 as well, where it says, Behold, I will tell you in your mind and 
in your heart by the power of the Holy Ghost. And in verse 2, they seem to have focused on preparing their mind, and in verse 3, preparing things of the heart. And what a powerful combination as they prepare to serve the Lord, to have both revelatory instruments engaged in this sacrifice. And that's also something you can see in all the different stories in these chapters, is the Lord working with people to prepare their mind and heart to receive his spirit, his word, even his, his character and countenance. So, in verse 4, we shift gears from the mind and heart preparation to they had been teaching the word of God for the space of 14 years among the Lamanites, having had much success in bringing them to the knowledge of the truth. Yea, by the power of their words, many were brought before the altar of God to call on his name and confess their sins before him. So what we learn here is we're picking up this story on the back end. Its 14-year mission is complete, and Alma runs into them um, in, in verse 1 by the land Manti when they're coming back into the land of Zarahemla from their 14-year mission. So now piecing some things together, you would say, hmm, they served a 14-year mission. It tells you that they prepared a lot more than their mind and their heart. They have what might be called grit, this stick to this this tenacity to say, we are going to keep working hard. This was a very difficult mission. We would call it lasting and enduring discipleship, and it's inspiring. Absolutely. And in speaking of, of missions, all of our lives are each a mission. There are things that we promised we would do. We were sent here for a reason. And so developing that, that grit in our covenant relationship, that determination, come what may, to stay on the covenant path and to invite others to join us, that is also part of life's mission. I love that, Kinley. There are so many different ways we can serve. Let's look at verse 5, for instance. Now these are the circumstances which attended them in their journeyings, for they had many afflictions. They did suffer much, both in body and in mind, such as hunger, thirst, and fatigue, and also much labor in the spirit. To me, that's one of the most amazing parts of this story, is we love, in, in chapter 17 through 22, we love to, to focus on the successful parts. We love to focus on the triumph of this story. But I'm not sure we would ever be able to read about the triumph if it weren't for them choosing to stay strong in the face of many afflictions, many um, sufferings and their labor in the spirit. This is stretching every part of their being. It's trying them. It's refining them. It's like the, the song, How Firm a Foundation. Their gold is being refined in the furnace of affliction, in, the, in these fiery trials that they're passing through. And it's inspiring because, for me, the message is, Tyler, your discipleship is not determined by the blessings the Lord gives you. It's, it's not defined by what happens at the end of the road. Your discipleship is defined by what you choose to do today, whether today happens to be a mountain peak of Revelation Day or a valley of the shadow of death and sorrow and despair and pain and anguish kind of a day. My discipleship isn't defined on where, where these outward influences may be coming into my life. It's my inward commitment to the Lord, regardless of what happens outwardly. That reminds me of President Nelson's talk, Think Celestial. It's like we all, we all have afflictions. We all have um, that refiner's fire that we need to go through to become who the Lord wants us to be. And oh, if we could just keep that perspective in those struggles of, of God's hand being there, especially in the struggles of him walking with us 
through those fires, through those valleys where it's dark, and making us an instrument in his hand through those very difficult things. Isn't it amazing how easy it is to recognize God's hand when we're in one of those mountain peaks of revelation moment, when everything is working out, when the success is flowing and, and you're filled with joy. It's so easy to be grateful and to thank the Lord. Much harder is to see his hand in those, those verse 5 moments of our life when we feel like we've been forsaken, left alone, uh, prayers perhaps not answered the way we would have uh, intended them to be or, or preferred them to be answered. I love this story because it, it gives us, in my mind, a, a very real look at mortality, a very realistic view of our own discipleship, that it's not all perfect. And the sacrifices are substantial and they're real. What we're seeing in chapter 17, verse 2, all the way down through 16, 17, are these preparatory elements that are coming into play for the four sons of Mosiah before they go serve this mission. And in every case, it's intense sacrifice. And then in verse 6, they sacrifice something that is extremely uh, tangible and desirable in the world in which we now live. Verse 6, Now these were their journeyings, having taken leave of their father Mosiah in the first year of the judges, having refused the kingdom which their father was desirous to confer upon them, and also this was the minds of the people. Now most of you watching or listening probably aren't thinking to yourself, oh, I, I can see how this applies to me because I gave up a throne as well, or I'm being offered a throne. Brothers and sisters, that's not usually how scriptures are best applied by taking the exact scenario and, and putting it into our own life. Because the fact is, is most of us, 99.9% .9 of us, will never be offered this kind of political or government leadership position. But there are a lot of thrones. There are a lot of kingdoms that this world is offering us in different forms. And there's part of us, the natural fallen nature inside of all of us, that would desperately like to have that kingdom of the world granted to us, that power that comes with it. But they're willing to sacrifice that and put that on the altar. I love looking down in verse 9 next. It talks about their, their immediate preparation right before they, they split up for their missions. They had fasted and prayed much that the Lord would grant unto them a portion of his spirit to go with them. It's that idea of, of setting aside the thrones or the, the crowns or the kingdoms the world offers and accepting what the Savior offers. That is his spirit to be with us through a covenant relationship. That's beautiful to me. I love that. And, and in fact, what if Ammon were standing here? What if Ammon, the, the man, were teaching us his own story? What would he say? Do you think he might say, oh, let me tell you what a terrible sacrifice it was to give up that kingdom and to spend all that time reading the scriptures and memorizing them and praying and fasting. Do you think he would lament any of the elements, the time, the possessions, anything at all that he had sacrificed from this story? Or do you think if he were standing here today, he would look at us and say, oh, I wish I had 10,000 lives to give the Lord to sacrifice for him because the sacrifices that I made were so small in comparison to what Jesus Christ gave me in return. Brothers and sisters, we will never, and I mean ever, walk away from the altar of the Lord poorer than we walked up. God, who holds worlds without number in his hand, is so loving and so kind and so all-knowing that when we're willing to make any sacrifices for him, he richly rewards us in abundance. And we're going to see that in this story. All of these sacrifices are going to bear fruit. These are all seeds that these 
these uh, faithful disciples are planting that are now going to bear fruit in miracles in the benefit of other people. Now, as we get ready to, to go into the land of Nephi with them, I love this promise that, that comes in the second half of verse 9 that the Lord had had given them this assurance that they would be an instrument in the hands of God to bring, if it were possible, their brethren, the Lamanites, to the knowledge of the truth, to the knowledge of the baseness of the traditions of their fathers, which were not correct. So there's this promise that, that they're going to be an instrument in, in the hands of the Lord, that they're not the ones who are going to be doing the work. The Lord isn't saying to them, go on the mission, good luck. Hope it goes well for you. It's the Lord who's already on that mission saying, will you come and allow me to take you into my hands as an instrument to do this work? It doesn't matter what your calling in the church is. It doesn't matter what your role in your family is. There's something powerful about turning your time, your talents, your devotion, your energy, your abilities, your intelligence, your feelings, turning it all over the Lord, saying, here I am, take me into thy hands and use me as an instrument and shape me so that I'm the right, uh, right type of instrument for thee to do the work that thou needs to be done. Because it's his work and we are invited to assist in it. It's not our work. We're not doing it in isolation. And that is so powerful because who of us, who of us is perfectly qualified or capable in whatever mission we're called to? But the beauty of the gospel is that we know we don't have to do it by ourselves. It's not a one man job or one person assignment. It's always two, you and the Savior. That's your covenant relationship, right? You never ever have to tackle something with your own strength or your own wisdom or your own knowledge, having that be the foundation for how everything's going to turn out. Your foundation is Jesus Christ. That's where you're built. He is, he is the rock. He is the strength. And it is through him we are enabled to participate in that work and enabled to become an instrument in the Lord's hands. And without that assurance, I, I'm not sure they would have been able to even uh, begin that mission. Look at verse 14's description of where they're headed. And assuredly it was great, for they had undertaken to preach the word of God to a... Now, if you start noticing the, the descriptive words for the, the group of people that they're now going in to teach, this is not a group of words that you would want on, on any list of, of transfer papers given to you as a missionary to say, okay, now you're going to go and serve among these people. They were a wild and a hardened and a ferocious people, a people who delighted in murdering the Nephites and robbing and plundering them, and their hearts were set upon riches and upon gold and silver and precious stones, yet they sought to obtain these things by murdering and plundering that they might not labor for them with their own hands. And then verse 15 tells you that they're uh, an indolent people who did worship idols and they have the curse of God that has fallen upon them because of the tradition of their fathers. So, here's, here's this incredibly difficult uh, scenario that's given to you and they now begin this mission among that group. And Ammon, in verse 18, was the chief among them and he administered unto them and then they departed and they, they spread out among the Lamanites, trusting completely in the Lord, which isn't exactly how I would have done this. If I were, I would want to stay together with my group, but you sense that they've prepared so well and they recognize that they are completely in the hands of the Lord, not the hands of the Lamanites. And by the way, these four, um, uh, they, they've got some companions with them, but th at least these four, they're all heirs to the Nephite throne. They, they, could have been, they could have been Nephite kings. So now, look at this comparison. They could have had the Nephite throne as a king, 
but they give up the throne to condescend to come down and serve a mission, a, a mission of mercy, a mission of reclaiming souls in a place that does not like the Nephites. And they're going to dedicate and devote their entire life to these people in order to then deliver them to a, a new kind of salvation that these people didn't even know about. This whole story is, for me, a beautiful comparison between Ammon and Jesus Christ. Not really a comparison, more a type and a shadow of how Ammon reflects this Christ-like pattern of giving up things, a life of ease and comfort and power to condescend and in the process is going to suffer, is going to labor, is going to have a very difficult time, but in the process is going to end up helping God save an entire group of people. It's the plan of salvation in, in symbolic overview form. And <clears throat> again, think of your own, your own life and your own missions. Look for the Savior there too. What have you been called to do that he's going to help you with? That you can become, become a Christ-like figure for someone in your life that is, that is lost in the dark somewhere, that needs a hand to reach out, to invite them back into a covenant relationship. We're back into that, that happy state of keeping the commandments, of living the gospel. It's beautiful. So as you go through these chapters, some uh, technique that you could use to deepen your scripture study would be to look for types, shadows, and symbols of Jesus Christ, things that reflect his attributes, his characteristics and perfections in the life and the ministry of Ammon and his brethren later on. It's beautiful. In fact, verse 20 is, is a great place to start. In verse 20. And as Ammon entered the land of Ishmael, the Lamanites took him and bound him, as was their custom to bind all Nephites who fell into their hands, and, carried the, and carry them before the king. And thus it was left to the pleasure of the king to slay them, or to retain them in captivity, or to cast them into prison, or to cast them out of his land, according to his will and pleasure. I, I do find it interesting, the words will and pleasure. Um, bear with me for a moment. In the whole, in the beginning, right? The Savior was willing to sacrifice his will for God's will, to make God's pleasure, God's desires, his own desires. That's still the story today for us. Are we willing to, to sacrifice um, our desires or our current pleasures for God's will and God's desires. I just think that's an interesting, an interesting lens through which, which to view, uh, view life and view our covenants, because that is embodied in the Savior. He was always willing to say, thy will be done, not mine. I love this Christ-like reflection that Ammon's ref uh, showing us here is that just like when Jesus comes to the earth, the earth doesn't welcome him with open arms. They don't make his entrance into this world easy for Mary, his mother, and Joseph, his stepfather. It's very difficult. And he, he's born in, in less than ideal circumstances. But it doesn't change who he is. It doesn't change his intent based on how people treat him, he's going to continue to maintain his identity and maintain his dignity to carry out his mission, regardless of how his mission is received or perceived by the people around him. Isn't it powerful that that, that Christ-like love, the willingness to forgive and to keep reaching out, that has the power to change hearts to soften them, to allow room for the Spirit to come. Lamoni specifically watch through this story 
as his will and his pleasures and his desires change because of what Ammon teaches him and shows him and because of the love that Ammon demonstrates for him and his people. It's very Christ-like. In fact, if, if we were to, to show a simple um, measuring meter here, we'll call this the, uh, the readiness o meter and it can, it can go from not at all ready, we're running on empty, all the way to full. And wherever, wherever this theoretical meter happens to be pointing, somewhere in this area, you're not at all ready to hear the gospel. Somewhere in here in this middle section, depending on the situation, you could be receptive. And somewhere over in this upper third part of this readiness o meter gauge, you're ready to believe and and the teacher can be ill prepared and you're still going to benefit from it because you're tuned in to the spirit i love this story because ammon comes in and he doesn't lead out with lamoni you're wicked your people are terrible and i've come to preach repent repentance to you and to baptize you and to help you be saved he doesn't do that because he recognizes that Lamoni is not ready for the gospel. He's one of the attributes that he's clearly developed is this attribute of patience and long suffering and an attribute of willing submission to be that instrument in God's hand to wait for things to develop until situations will occur that will cause Lamoni's heart and mind to be softened and turned heavenward. And only then will he teach the gospel um, in, in a beautiful way later on in this chapter. Yes. So jumping in with the story then, watch for, for the Savior's character in this through Emmet, like we had on the board there. This is beautiful. Jesus Christ is all over in this chapter. So pay attention. Yeah, so he begins by saying that the king asks him in verse 22 if it was Ammon's desire to dwell in the land among the Lamanites or among his people. And I love Ammon's Christ-like response, this, this heir to the Nephite throne, how he responds to this question. And Ammon said unto him, Yea, I desire to dwell among this people for a time, yea, perhaps until the day I die. So the Savior was the kind of leader that didn't dwell aloof or apart from the people. He walked their soil. He breathed their air. He took their infirmities upon him, their flesh and the struggles of, of mortality upon him. And then the king, being so pleased with Ammon, says, hey, do you, do you want to marry one of my daughters? Uh, he, he wants Ammon to be his son-in-law. And Ammon's response is pretty simple here. Nay, but I will be thy servant. I love that Christ-like response. I want to be thy servant. He who could have had all this ruling power among the Nephites takes on this servant role among the Lamanites. It's, it's a beautiful principle once again every time you get a calling in the church. Brothers and sisters, those callings are not intended to hurt you or to be a, a major infliction of pain or disruption of your life. Those callings are an invitation for each of us to become a little bit more like Jesus Christ by sacrificing our time, our energy, our talents to benefit other people and to try to connect them with the Lord, to become their servant, not so we can get something from them, but so that we can give things to them. I love this part. That, that is so Christ-like. His whole mission was never to get something out of us or to take things from us. His whole mission is to invest everything he has in us. That is powerful. So then the assignment he receives is to go and watch the flocks of Lamoni. 
I can't think of too many other symbol, symbolic uh, assignments he could have received that are more Christ-like than, I want you to be a shepherd. Go watch over the flocks because he's not just a shepherd. He becomes a good shepherd, one who is willing to, to lay down his life even for the flock. And in this case, verse 26 tells us, after he had been in the service of the king three days, he was with the Lamanitish servants going forth with their flocks to the place of water. And it makes me wonder, Kinley, what would, what would it be like at the end of day one as your Ammon serving among the flocks? What would it be like on day two? What, what would the, the feelings of discouragement or maybe the temptations from the devil be that are placed in his mind and his heart as he's a, a lowly servant among the flocks? I think that many of us feel that way often, right? <clears throat> you have an assignment, you have a mission, so to say, and you feel like maybe you're not making that much of a difference, or like maybe you don't, you're not where you're supposed to be, or you, you came on this mission and you're not converting people right off the bat, you're not seeing the fruits right away. That is, that is so relatable, is it not? And yet, it's kind of like Alma teaches about faith. Those, those seeds that you plant, they take time to grow. You can't expect to, to put that seed in the soil and have a tree and eat the fruit the next day. And it is interesting to me that, that Ammon seems to understand this. He is willing to, to wait. He is willing to work on those small things as he waits. There is a good lesson there for all of us. Rather than being frustrated, you know, maybe beating yourself up when things don't go exactly to plan or when A plus B doesn't equal C when you think it should, trust the Lord. Let God prevail. Keep doing the things you're supposed to be doing. Keep doing the small things. Keep putting yourself in those places where you can minister to people where you can continue to work even if you don't see the fruits. And if you have to wait, you're in good company. I loved what you said earlier about Jesus Christ. Think of his, his mortal ministry. How many people were so quick to believe him and to stay with him? He, he was the perfect teacher, the perfect missionary, the perfect disciple. And yet, maybe there weren't as many fruits as one would expect right then. And yet, you look far down the corridors of time at all the fruits, and they are numberless. So again, just keep that eternal perspective. Think celestial. Trust that God sees what's going to come of those little seeds that you're planting. So keep planting them. So, now the story accelerates. Verse 27, so he's been in the service of the king for three days, back in verse 26, and 27 says, Therefore, as Ammon and the servants of the king were driving forth their flocks to the place of water, behold, a certain number of Lamanites who had been with their flocks to water stood and scattered the flocks of Ammon and the servants of the king, and they scattered them insomuch that they fled many ways. So this group who's already there, they scatter the flocks of Ammon and the Lamanitish servants. And now we get a, a beautiful insight into this story as you watch Ammon interact with these servants who are with him. Verse 28. Verse 28. Now the servants of the king began to murmur, saying, Now the king will slay us as he has our brethren, because their flocks were scattered, scattered by the wickedness of these men. And they began to weep exceedingly, saying, Behold, our flocks are scattered already. They, they're in this position where they can't save themselves. They've lost something and they can't, they can't reclaim it, right? They, they're in this very upsetting position. It sounds like many groups of servants have, have been killed before for losing the flocks and they don't know what to do. They can't deliver themselves. We learned back in chapter 17, verse 15, 
that they did worship idols. So this is a people who have devoted their, their uh, religious devotion to idols, which means in the moment of struggle, in the moment of desperate need, if you turn to your god or your gods, these idols, I think the reality is, is stark for these servants, is there's nothing our God can do to deliver us, to restore these flocks. We now become a victim of this circumstance that life has thrown at us. We're stuck. There's nothing, as Kinley said, there's nothing I can do to deliver myself, and the God that I worship, or the gods, in this case the idols, they can't deliver me. Isn't it fascinating that whatever you worship, like truly worship, you end up emulating or becoming more like that object of your worship? Well, if you worship an idol, then what you're going to do is become more idol, spelled I-D-L-E. That's exactly what's happening here is they're sitting down, giving up, saying life just got really complex and really hard and I can't fix it, so now I'm going to lament the fact that I've become a victim of this circumstance. Whereas on the opposite side, when you worship God, when you worship Jesus Christ, then you engage by using your agency to try to reflect that Christ-like those Christ-like attributes that he showed us throughout his life. You become more anxiously engaged in a good cause. You deepen your faith. You don't lessen it. You, you serve more, not less, in this moment of, of deep need. And he reflects that beautifully here. Cool. And in verse 29, this is, this is Ammon's response to the situation. His heart was swollen within him for joy. For he said, I will show forth my power unto these my fellow servants. Pause and think of the Savior and his power and what his mission was as we read this next part. He says, my power unto these my fellow servants, or the power which is in me in restoring the flocks to the king, that I may win the hearts of these my fellow servants, that I may lead them to believe in my words. I love the last word of that verse, because if you take the S off, it's another name for Jesus Christ. This is the, uh, to me, this looks like the role of, of all prophets through the ages. I love this connection between the Savior, between his prophets in the past, and especially his prophets today, especially if you look at verse 31. I think this should sound very familiar from our current prophets and apostles. My brethren, be of good cheer, and let us go in search of the flocks, and we will gather them together and bring them back unto the place of water, and thus we will preserve the flocks unto the king. Is that not the message of, of our prophets today? It's beautiful. You have the layers of, of symbolism here. Of course, Ammon teaching Jesus Christ. Picture him offering these words with our heavenly king being the one he's restoring the flock to. And then the living prophets and the past prophets inviting us to come into that folk, to be part of that flock. Beautiful. I love this. This gathering Israel on both sides of the veil. Those waters of Sebus could be the waters of baptism for missionary efforts on this side of the veil, and they could be the waters in a baptismal font in the temples of our God that dot the earth. And we're being invited by the Lord to be servants or instruments in his hand to go out and gather those flocks back into this place of water, the place of safety where those covenants can be established and people can enter into this covenant community of discipleship jointly and, and collectively with the Lord. It's such a, a beautiful symbol. 
Now, most of that group of Lamanites, they assume, oh, that, that there's a Nephite. Any one of us could beat him. And all of a sudden, rocks start coming into their group and some of their number begin to die. He's hitting them with such force and with such accuracy that he's killing them. So halfway through verse 36, it tells you that they began to be astonished at his power. Nevertheless, they were angry because of the slain of their brethren, and they were determined that he should fall. So now they, they say, let's go get him. So they rush him with their clubs, their swords, with their weapons. And I love this. It says, everyone who lifted his club to smite Ammon, he smote off their arms with his sword. For he did withstand their blows by smiting their arms with the edge of his sword, insomuch that they began to be astonished. This is the second time they began to be astonished. They're a little, little slow on the uptake here. And then it tells you in verse 38 that he had slain six of them by the sword, and, or by the sling, and their leader he slew by the sword. I don't know about you, but if I were one of the Lamanitish servants who is huddled down near the flock trying to keep them together and I'm watching this take place, I think my readiness to learn, my willingness to listen to this guy is going to go up significantly. I'm noticing something. He's not acting in, in normal human capacities. There's something different about this guy. And when he finishes, he doesn't gloat. He doesn't say, huh, did you all see that? He simply says, what was the next thing that the king had asked us to do as his servants? He continues serving. He, he doesn't draw attention to what he's accomplished. Beautiful. And that conclusion in verse 39, again, with the image of our good shepherd, they watered their flocks and returned them to the pasture of the king. Just, just remember, whatever the struggle, whatever the difficulty being faced, in the end, if Jesus is the shepherd for you, then the story will end peacefully. Ultimately, everything will be made right. The flock will be watered with living water and returned to the pasture of their heavenly king. I love that. Now, in chapter 18, they take these, these arms before King Lamoni, and Ammon's out in the stables getting the, the horses and the chariots ready to go. And there's this amazing realization that strikes King Lamoni in verse 5. Here's Lamoni who has the first recognition of this influence of the Holy Ghost working upon him, causing him to think and feel things that he's never felt before. Verse 5 says, Now this was the tradition of Lamoni, which he had received from his father, that there was a great spirit. Notwithstanding they believed in a great spirit, they supposed that whatsoever they did was right. So he's been raised. Whatever you do, it's right. You define rightness or righteousness by your own uh, volition, by whatever you choose to think or say or do. You define it. It's all good. And now for the first time in his life, it says, nevertheless, Lamoni began to fear exceedingly with fear lest he had done wrong in slaying his servants. So his readiness starts creeping up after he sees the, the evidence. Here's the testimony of these servants. Now the Holy Ghost carries a message deeper into his heart. None of those servants came in and said, King Lamoni, you were wrong to kill the servants before us. They didn't say that. They're letting the Holy Ghost do that teaching. They're just showing the scenario, giving their witness, and the Lord's doing the rest. And isn't that interesting that one of the first, first steps for Lamoni on his readiness, O Meteor, is recognizing his need for help, for, for saving, that he's done something wrong, he needs help. That's our story too, is recognizing that we need Jesus Christ every day, every hour. Now the next 
increase on his, on his willingness to hear the gospel, on his level of readiness. We see it in verse 10. He had asked, Where, where's Ammon now? And they said, well, he's out preparing the horses and chariots. And verse 10 says, when King Lamoni had heard this, he was more astonished because of the faithfulness of Ammon, saying, Surely there has not been any servant among all my servants that has been so faithful as this man, for even he doth remember all my commandments to execute them. I hope that that reminds you of more than just Ammon's story. I hope you're hearing reflected there the Christ-like uh, example of the one person who perfectly remembered all of the commandments given to him by God, and he perfectly did them. In fact, once again, if Ammon were here, I could be wrong, but I don't think Ammon would say, ah, see how good and faithful I was? See what a great example I was? I think Ammon wouldn't draw the attention to himself. I think Ammon might say, I was simply trying to reflect the divine attributes of Jesus Christ. It wasn't about me. It was about trying to become more like him. That reminds me of just a small insight that a friend of our family shared, that rather than holding yourself up as a light, you, you hold up a mirror to reflect the Savior's light through you. That through you, people don't, don't see you and think, oh, that's the light. They see you and they know the Savior better for having interacted with you. And they walk away knowing, knowing more about the light in the Savior's eyes because they could see it in yours. I love that, and, and that builds, <clears throat> you, you see that exact scenario play out in verses 12 through, through 17, when Ammon now comes in for that interaction with King Lamoni, and you can almost picture Ammon saying, hmm, where are we on the readiness o -meter? And he recognizes that, okay, Lamoni's in a better place. We have a little more interaction here. Uh, th this back and forth, give and take in the conversation, as Lamoni becomes even more amazed as Ammon reads his, his mind, reads his thoughts, discerns the, the, the thoughts of his mind and the feelings in his heart. And then finally, Ammon asks him this question, verse 22, Wilt thou hearken unto my words if I tell thee by what power I do these things. And the king said, Yea, I will believe all thy words. In other words, the king's readiness level is now over here. Now and only now can Ammon with confidence teach the, the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and know that it will be received. He's not just throwing out random seeds like the parable of the sower at this point. He knows this man is ready. He's ready to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And what a beautiful moment this must have been. I love too that Lamona is asking so many questions here, but he's not asking in an accusatory or a doubtful way. He is asking with a desire to believe. I find that when I ask those kind of questions, it is like opening, opening a floodgate for the Spirit. When you ask with a sincere desire to believe, even if you have to wait for the answer a long time, the Spirit will be there and that answer will come. And so now, verse 24, th there's a word that sticks out to me. It says, And Ammon began to speak unto him with boldness and said unto him, Believest thou that there is a God? I like the fact that Ammon has prepared the situation in such a way that he knows that the Lord is going to be doing the real teaching here, and so he can now teach with boldness. He's not holding back. He's not tentative. He's not testing the waters, so to speak. He's now speaking with boldness, and he begins with question number one. Do you believe in God? At which point, Lamoni is very confused, doesn't know what that means. And then Ammon finds him where he is in his level of understanding. In verse 26, he says, Believest thou that there is a great spirit? And he said, Yea. Shortest verse in the Book of Mormon, by the way, verse 27. There are a few of them. 
these, these four word verses. And he said, yea. And Ammon said, this is God. I love how Ammon doesn't make fun of King Lamoni for a, a partial truth, belief. He doesn't tear down what King Lamoni believes to then say, now let me, now that I've destroyed your faith, let me build it uh, afresh the right way. He doesn't do that. He finds King Lamoni where he is and he builds on that. It, it reminds me of one of my all-time favorite phrases that uh, President Gordon B. Hinckley shared on a variety of occasions when it comes to this topic of, of gathering Israel on this side of the veil. His invitation was, bring all the good that you have and see if we can add to it. We're confident that, that the Lord will add to your belief. So I love that pattern here. And then you look as Ammon, as soon as he's got that, that gauge on the readiness o meter, what are the first things he teaches? I think it's beautiful that you see this in our living prophets today as well. They teach the correct identity of God and then our correct identity. He teaches who God is and then that we are his children. Think about what a foundation just that knowledge is. If you understand correctly who God is, then you are so much better able to understand correctly who you are and who you can become through Jesus Christ. It's powerful. So after addressing the identity of God, as Kinley said in verse 36, we get the doctrine of the creation, and then he gives the doctrine of the fall, establishing our absolute need for the Savior, and then he unfolds the holy scriptures in front of King Lamoni, because he hasn't had them, the access to these scripture stories. And he then hits the principle of redemption. So we get creation, fall, and the atonement of Jesus Christ in verse 39. This plan of redemption that requires the coming of Christ. And once Lamoni has heard this message, his heart, we already recognized, was open. Look at his response in verse 41. And he began to cry unto the Lord, saying, O Lord, have mercy, according to thy abundant mercy, which thou hast upon the people of Nephi, have upon me and upon my people. And when he had said this, he fell unto the earth as if he were dead. God is now going to take this, this Lamanite king over the people of Ishmael, and he's going to give him a three-day experience where, as for all intents and purposes, many people think he's, he's dead, but he's anything but dead. He's dead to the world, but he's now waking up and becoming alive in Christ. The Lord is shaping and molding another instrument through the, the efforts of Ammon's missionary efforts among this people. And it begins here with, with King Lamoni. It's amazing to watch these real people go through these real experiences and make real lasting connections, deep, uh, lifelong connections with the Lord and with each other. So he's, he is in this state of a coma as he's on this spiritual reforming journey with the Lord, and his wife, King Lamoni's wife, is sitting by his bedside when many people are coming to her saying, he's dead, you need to bury him. And she doesn't believe that he's dead, but she has nothing to go on. So she calls Ammon in, and Ammon, who came on this mission among the Lamanites to increase faith among the Lamanites, he now gets this interaction with this incredibly faithful woman. And I love what he says here when he tells her, verse 8, he is not dead, but he sleepeth in God, and on the morrow he shall rise again. So Ammon asks her this very, very simple question, believest thou this? 
And she said unto him, I have no witness save thy word and the word of our servants. Nevertheless, I believe that it shall be according as thou hast said. So Ammon, this great missionary from the Nephites who came to, to save the Lamanites from unbelief, he makes this comment, Blessed art thou because of thy exceeding faith. I say unto thee, woman, there has not been such great faith among all the people of the Nephites. I love this. He's saying, I came to, to teach the gospel to you people and to increase your faith, but I haven't seen your level of faith among all of my people who are supposedly the, the righteous group of people. And it's, it's this beautiful principle that God has scattered faith in him broadcast, and some of those seeds have grown and are, have produced great fruit, not just in the church or the fold of God, but in other peoples throughout the world. And what an amazing thing it is to hear stories and meet people who have found the gospel of Jesus Christ from places and in cultures and in settings you would have never thought it was possible for them to have any kind of faith, and yet they do. So then, the next day, at the appointed hour, Lamoni rises up and notice the very first words out of his mouth in verse 12. He says, he stretched forth his hand unto the woman, his wife, and said, Blessed be the name of God, and blessed art thou. Because he came closer to the Lord, it now caused him not just to see his own relationship with God more clearly, but his relationship with the one other person that he is commanded in Scripture to love with all of his heart, and that is his, his wife. So he blesses the name of God, and he blesses her. And then he responds, for I am, for as sure as thou livest, behold, I have seen my Redeemer, and he shall come forth and be born of a woman, and he shall redeem all mankind who believe on his name. And then his heart is swollen and he falls down again, and so does she, and so does Ammon. And it's this incredible domino effect for those people, this outpouring, Pentecostal levels of an outpouring of the Spirit, and they're overcome. And I love the word joy. It says they sink with joy. It reminds me of, of another quote by President Nelson where he said, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. And you saw that in the first words out of Lamoni's mouth. He's talking to his wife about, about his Redeemer and this testimony he has. That is, that is a joy that all of us can carry in our own hearts. That joy that comes from knowing the Savior, from, from learning about Him, and, and being filled with gratitude for everything that He has done for us. So in verse 16, we're introduced to this incredible disciple of, of Christ. But once again, this is a disciple that is found in a very uh, non-conventional place. You wouldn't expect to find a disciple here among the Lamanites in the land of Ishmael, or in the city of Ishmael. It says, everyone fell to the earth, save it were one of the Lamanitish women. There's that word again. Abish isn't a full Lamanite. And we don't know what Mormon meant by using the label Lamanitish. But she's part Lamanite, part something else, maybe a, an outsider. She's a servant to the queen, so we don't know her, her level of, of status in their, socio, uh, in their social um, levels at that time. But she's a Lamanitish woman, and her name is Abish. She, having been converted unto the Lord for many years on account of a remarkable vision of her father, Abish, has quietly been worshiping the Lord. She's been converted unto the Lord for many years and living her life accordingly. And yet, during all that time of her conversion, 
Here she is as a Lamanitish servant to the queen. She's not giving up on her conversion to the Lord because life isn't all of a sudden becoming prosperous and, and rich for her. She just keeps moving forward with what she has available to her, and that is her agency to stay converted to the Lord. I think it's interesting here that, that when everyone else has, has fallen down, overcome with this joy, isn't it kind of interesting that the one person that doesn't is someone that's been, been converted already, that has experienced the Spirit before? Now, I've thought about this occasionally, that she may have, I don't know, it's easy to compare. She may have thought to herself and wondered, well, why, why am I not having this experience? Why, why not me? I've been faithful all this time. But she doesn't do that. She, she looks around and she sees an opportunity to, to invite others to come and to know the Savior better. I think there's a powerful lesson there. That comparison, when we look at our own circumstances and our own lives, and we compare them to others and we say, oh, they're more faithful than I am because of this blessing and this thing in their lives, or oh, this is going different for them than for me. I must not have as much faith as them. Maybe, maybe take a step back from those comparisons and just give the Lord your best efforts and don't worry about the results or what comes of it. Just give your efforts, give your whole soul, and then let the, let the Lord work miracles through you. And sometimes those miracles may surprise you in the way that they come about, as in this setting here, where she leaves and she goes from house to house and she invites all the people to come and see what the Lord has done. And then in the, in the next page, we get some interesting responses to this. I think namely one of them being that what most of the people see when they first arrive is that there's a Nephite. Now that's also interesting to me. How often do you look at someone and make a quick judgment just based off of what you see? You don't know anything about them, but you see, oh, that's, that's a Nephite. Interesting, huh? That they, they look at a prophet of God and the first thing they see has nothing to do with his character, his soul, his his mission. Nothing of that. It's just one quick look at how he, how he appears to them. I love that insight. And to the point where the, the group starts to murmur, some of them, and one of them, whose brother had been killed by Ammon out at the waters of Sebus, he comes forward and he's angry and he, it says, verse 22, Now one of them whose brother had been slain with the sword of Ammon, being exceedingly angry with Ammon, drew his sword and went forth that he might let it fall upon Ammon to slay him. And as he lifted the sword to smite him, behold, he fell dead. Now that had to be a shocking moment for everybody who was standing there. Less shocking for Abish. But I love verse 23, because Mormon jumps in. He doesn't say, thus we see, but he says, now we see that Ammon could not be slain. For the Lord had said unto Mosiah, his father, I will spare him, and it shall be unto him according to thy faith. Therefore Mosiah trusted him unto the Lord. I love this when scriptures validate and illustrate God's perfected attributes. And one of God's attributes is he isn't just a God of power with the ability to protect and save. He's also a God of truth. He cannot lie. And he told King Mosiah, if you let your boys go on this mission, I will deliver them. And no power on earth or in hell combined can overthrow your boys in, in this context because the promise has been given by God. That is such a powerful uh, part of the story for me, we can move forward with that boldness that comes in Christ, not, not in our own uh, strength of our own arm, our own ability to deliver ourselves, but in God's ability. Because you'll notice Ammon, he's, he's passed out on the ground. He has no way to defend himself against this sword. But God can deliver him, and God did deliver him. 
and it causes now people who, when they first came into this setting and made that quick judgment Kinley was talking about of, oh, there's a, a terrible Nephite here, it changes their readiness o meter from hating him to now wondering what in the world just happened and they notice that that he can't uh, he can't be slain, causing their hearts to now start uh, reacting. And you have an interesting contrast here as we as we move forward with the story of so Abish comes back and she sees all this contention. Now that was not her intent at all, but I think it's interesting that we are taught that that the devil is the father of contention. He's the one that stirs people up to anger. And our savior is called the Prince of Peace. And look at what happens as, as Abish wakes up the queen and then the king stands up. And these people listening to their, their king and queen now testify of truth. You get this, this beautiful feeling of, of peace. There's no longer fighting going on, at least not in the same way. It says in verse 31 that as many as heard his words, speaking of Ammon, believed and were converted. And then verse 32, but there were many of, among them who would not hear his words. And when I first, when I first read this, I don't know that I, I interpreted it as deeply as it can be, because the next line, therefore they went their way. These are all people in the same room. They're all hearing the same message. And some of them are opening their hearts to this. And others, others would not hear. This is, this is not talking about just sound on an eardrum. They're hearing these words, but they would not hear in their hearts. And they went their way. And so the lesson here for me is, Again, going back to, to what we talked about at the beginning, being willing to sacrifice, to set aside our, our will, our own way, to walk in the Savior's way. I think that's, that's a powerful lesson. It's also beautiful to note what the very first words out of King Lamoni's wife's mouth happened to be when Abish lifts her up in the midst of all that contention. The very first words she says, O oh, blessed Jesus, who has saved me from an awful hell. O oh, blessed God, have mercy on this people. She, like Lamoni, is now turned outward. The closer you come to God, the more you have the ability to see other people from God's perspective. The more you understand them the more you love them, even if they're doing bad things. It, it reflects that Christ-like statement on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It's this divine compassion that becomes more a part of us. We become less offended by people doing bad things or saying bad things or treating us poorly. And our prayer becomes increasingly, oh, bless this people. So now you come to chapter 20 in the midst of this great success that Ammon's enjoying in the, the land of Ishmael, the city of Ishmael with King Lamoni's people. There are other missionaries who came down to the land of, or up in this case, to the land of Nephi. Uh, all of Ammon's brothers, as well as the companions that came with them, they've run into a little bit of trouble and the Holy Ghost warns Ammon to leave and go to the land of Madoni to get Aaron and his, his brethren, Mulekai and Amma, you know, at least two of the names of these companions that came with them, get them out of prison as well. When King Lamoni hears this, he says, wait a minute, how did you know that they're in prison, that they need to be delivered? And he very simply says, there's, there's no other way to know but by the, the Holy Spirit. And so he says, well, I'll, I'll go with you because the king in the land of Madonna, he's, he's my friend, Antiomno, and, and I'll help you. And so thus begins this journey. 
which is interrupted on the way from Ishmael to Madoni by running into King Lamoni's father, who happens to be the king over all the land of the Lamanites. And if you want to consider a readiness ometer that is really struggling, it would be this old king's uh, level of, of preparedness to hear the gospel. Because when he first sees him, he does exactly what Kinley had mentioned before of saying, verse 10, Whither art thou going with this Nephite, who is one of the children of a liar? He's instantaneously judged Ammon to be this terrible person because of their traditions among the Lamanites. And it's interesting, his response to Lamoni's story of everything that's happened is, is anger. And it says that Lamoni is, is astonished. Later on, later on in this story, the king is astonished because of Ammon's love for Lamoni. What an interesting comparison. There's astonishment on both sides, but on one there's this hate and anger and bitterness, and on the other there's this, this love and forgiveness, these open arms. That's, that's a beautiful pattern of, of the Savior and what he offers us. It's beautiful. I love this because if you contrast for a moment the way King Lamoni's father is looking at Ammon compared to how Ammon is seeing King Lamoni's father, it's this beautiful setup that Kinley talked about, the, the contrast between the way God sees us and the way the devil sees us in that Lamoni is standing there and his dad is saying, Lamoni, you will kill this Nephite. And Lamoni says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. He, he doesn't give his dad the details, but to say, nobody can kill him. And if you like your arm, uh, I would suggest that you stay away from him as well. It, we don't get that part of the story. But King Lamoni's father, when he recognizes that his own son won't kill this Nephite, he then turns his hatred from Ammon to his own son. So if we were looking at a readiness ometer for King Lamoni's father, it's nowhere in this quadrant. In fact, it's going to very quickly break. <laughs> it's going to drop off of the readiness ometer altogether because he now comes forth to kill his own son. At which point, where is the Christ-like position for Ammon to, to take in this scenario? And this is where Ammon comes between Lamoni and this this threatening danger or this, this stressful situation. And now, as the story unfolds, we go back to this first screen of what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to give up? And why are you willing to give that up? And we see this play out as King Lamoni's father tries to attack his own son and, and Lamoni is defended by Ammon. Ammon withstood the blows of the king and then paralyzes basically his, uh, the king's arms and has him on the sword's edge. He, he can kill him and the king recognizes that. So the king is going to make an offering. He's going to sacrifice something in verse 23. 23. Now the king, fearing he should lose his life, said, If thou wilt spare me, I will grant unto thee whatsoever thou wilt ask, even to half of my kingdom. So the thing he's willing to sacrifice is half of an earthly kingdom in exchange for his life, that's, the, that's the, the exchange that is being offered, this great exchange. Give me my life, I'll give you half of my kingdom. Which, by the way, not a great offering, because which half of the kingdom is going to want to follow a Nephite? And even if you do give him half of the kingdom, how hard is it going to be to poison him or kill him in his sleep? This is, this is a very um, earth perspective offering or sacrifice that King Lamoni's father is making because he has been led to believe that all Nephites are money-grubbing, power-hungry thieves who are willing to do anything to, to take away 
things that, that you have. That, that's his perspective. Can you picture the look on Ammon's face as he looks down at the king? Not with greed in his eyes, but with love and kindness and compassion. Not with rebuke, but with charity reflected there. As he says, no, I don't want any of your kingdom. I don't want anything that you have to offer me. I just want two things. I want my brothers released from prison, and I want your son to be able to have some religious freedom. I want your son to be able to do whatever he wants to do in worshiping God. That's all I want. And at that point, the readiness meter for this old king starts to go in fast motion. So after Ammon gets Aaron and his brethren out of prison, they ask the question, how did you, how did you accomplish all of this? He gives the, the examples. And then Aaron goes to meet with this king. And you get this incredible story of, in, in chapter 22, of Aaron coming into this old king thinking it's going to be like it was for Ammon at the beginning with Lamoni, where you're going to have to serve him first and wait for the Lord to, to set up the scenario where he's ready to be taught. The problem is, is when they walk in and offer in verse 3, we will be thy servants, the king said unto them, Arise, for I will grant unto you your lives, and I will not suffer that you shall be my servants, but I will insist that you shall administer unto me. And he goes on to say, I don't need any more servants. What I need right now is somebody to teach me, and I'm ready to learn. And so Aaron launches into this beautiful discussion. And I love in verse 3, he also mentions that his mind has been troubled. He's been wrestling and thinking about these things because of the generosity and greatness of their brother Ammon. Now think of those two words describing our Savior. Generosity and greatness. The beautiful thing here being that when we try to emulate the Savior, when we, we sing with all our hearts, I'm trying to be like Jesus, you never know the seeds you might be planting, that someone else might, might come to know the Savior better from watching and come to desire to know him better. So keep, keep singing that song. So after Aaron teaches the same lessons that Lamoni had learned from Ammon, teaches him about God and the Great Spirit, about the creation, and after the creation, reading all the scriptures, unfolding the fall of man and our need for the redemption that comes through Jesus Christ. It's all there in verses 5 through 13. And our complete need for faith and repentance in verse 14. Ammon expounded all the, or Aaron expounded all these things unto the king. And then you notice the growth, the deep rooted uh, growth that is happening right before our very eyes with this old king. Verse 15, it came to pass that after Aaron had expounded these things unto him, the king said, what shall I do? that I may have this eternal life of which thou hast spoken. This is a guy who isn't used to asking these kinds of questions. He used to, he's used to giving the orders and being obeyed, telling people what to do, not asking, what do I need to do? This is so beautiful as you watch him sacrificing now real things. Th these are real offerings that the king is making at this point in contrast to what happened back in chapter 20. You look at the bottom of of 15 there, and it says, Behold, said he, I will give up all that I possess. Yea, I will forsake my kingdom that I may receive this great joy. I'll give up my entire kingdom for this eternal life. Can, you can hear the echo of the Savior's invitation. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That beautiful, beautiful invitation of, of learning to care about things that last forever, of learning to think celestial, of looking forward to what God has to offer us, of what he will put into our hands. It's powerful. And, and that principle can find manifestations in all aspects of the gospel. It could be in something as simple as paying tithes and offerings, 
some would say, I can't afford to pay tithing. And I would bring it back to this King Lamoni's father principle of, I can't afford not to pay tithing because the law of tithing has very little to do with the money I pay. And it has everything to do with the love for the Lord that I have in my heart, that that tithing becomes an outward manifestation of that inward love for him. And as I lay money on the altar, you'll notice my hand is now available and open to receive whatever blessings God has in store for me. And his promise is sure. He will open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so great that there shall not be room enough to receive it. It may come in financial ways. It may come in health ways. It may be, be coming in spiritual blessings, but it will come. And it's this beautiful opportunity to let go of just a little bit of what I have that's been given to me by God, by the way, in exchange for now being open to receive whatever it is that God has in store for me. And that principle can be applied to all aspects of the gospel. Now, I love what Aaron did in response to King Lamoni's father's question. He doesn't say, let me tell you what you need to do. He says, that's a really good question, basically. And in verse 18, if thou wilt bow down before God, yea, if thou wilt repent of all thy sins and wilt bow down before God and call on his name in faith, believing that ye shall receive, then shalt thou receive the hope which thou desirest. And now you get, in, in my opinion, one of the sweetest prayers ever, ever recorded in all of Scripture in verse 18. It says, O God, Aaron hath told me that there is a God. And if there is a God, and if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me? And I will give away all my sins to know thee, and that I may be raised from the dead, and be saved at the last day. And now when the king had said these words, he was struck as if he were dead. And thus begins this three-day journey of redemption, the process of redemption beginning for this king as well. So we have another layer. The king put on the altar much more than his kingdom and all that he possessed. He put all his sins on the altar. It seems that it's easier to give your, your possessions than it is to give your soul to the Lord. So in exchange for all of his sins, he says, I'll, I'll sacrifice those to come to truly know thee. And in President Nelson's talk, Overcome the World and Find Rest, he talks about some of these things, about learning to care more about what God has to offer and about that celestial life than any earthly thing. I want to read a little part from his talk. He says, what does it mean to overcome the world? to overcome our, our desires for certain things right here, right now. He says, it means overcoming the temptation to care more about the things of this world than the things of God. It means trusting the doctrine of Christ more than the philosophies of men. You see both Lamoni and his father trusting in the words of a prophet of God over any other voice. It means delighting in truth, denouncing deception, and becoming a humble follower of Christ. Again, you see it right here. It means choosing to refrain from anything that drives the Spirit away. It means being willing to give away even our favorite sins, to come to know the Savior, to give up all that I have so that He can give me all that He has. Beautiful. So, as this story concludes, the message for us is to figure out in our own families, in our own lives, in the, the map of our own discipleship, how we can devote more and more and more of our life to the Lord and focus on Him and be willing to keep working through this process of growing conversion and discipleship, increasing our own readiness o meter to listen to, receive, and live 
the words of Jesus Christ that come to us from the scriptures, from the living prophets, and as testified and taught by the Holy Ghost in our own life. Often in scripture you hear Jesus Christ referred to as the Lord of the outstretched arms. And I often think if you saw that hand reaching out to you, what would be in the very center of it? It's a testimony of his love, of everything that he has sacrificed for us, of everything he has to offer us. So I suppose the invitation moving forward is to open your arms to him, sacrifice whatever it is that is that next step for you, the next step on the covenant path to help you to to come more closely into that covenant relationship with him. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Know that you're loved.